The 386 isn't exactly obscure. I think pretty much anyone who's even vaguely into old computers is going to know about it. And it became the basis for really most later PC processors. It would go on to kill off all the, the micros like the Amiga eventually, but it was going to take a few years for the price to come down. Before the price did come down and integration got better though, well, quite often you had a, a giant monstrosity and well, they tell you it's not the size and it's how you use it, but nobody in their right mind, even me, is going to say no to having a few extra inches added on. This is the giant men's 386, is the only way I can really think to describe it. Yeah, hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and it's a big 386. It's, uh, you're not getting short change with that fucking thing. So, well, uh, yeah. We're not really going to do any good standing here just talking about it, so I guess we better uh, have a look at it and take the, the lid off and see what's in there, because it's a, a bit of a funky one. So, well, uh, yeah, you know, you know this big 80s hardware, you, you don't tend to see it anywhere now as much as the other stuff, so <laughs> this, this would have been some pretty high-end kit in its time, so let's uh, let's get into that. Well, the elephant in the room really is that chassis. It's pretty big and heavy. It takes all the boxes, and you know that whatever is in there ought to be serious potatoes. The second thing that stands out is the CD-ROM drive, but we'll come back to that a bit later on. And the real fun stuff is hidden away behind the bezels and stuff anyway, so obviously the internals is really what we come to look at, I think. The case is so tall and top-heavy that it needs this large fat around its base, and even then it will still rock side to side if you stand there on my wonky floors with the foot flexing slightly. I'm not sure I trust that at this age to not just shatter. Ooh, ooh, that's horrible. Well, time for a quick tangent. Uh, let's be honest, there's a bit of a nerdy channel, isn't it? And I'd wager we've got at least some bleed of with vacuum heads around here. So this is my 90s pneumatic HVR200, made in England. It's not very special, there's millions like this out there. Uh, Henry's been at war against Household Dirt for a really long time now, and he's actually doing quite well, having been vacuuming up my dirt since I was a kid. So, yeah, he's been around quite a long time. A bit like the 386, size kind of matters, and he's bursting a murder that saps four-figure wattage from the wall. And his original tools are a little bit beat up, but after decades of regular abuse, it's kind of hard to be mad about it. Now, on the subject of murders, back to that 386. Well, that's a rather interesting noise, isn't it? At the back of the machine, we have a big empty space that I wish a fan was in, and of course the power supply, just like any regular machine. Then these four slots here. Some larger chassis had these, and whilst a small number of full-size AT motherboards did actually have slots up here, most didn't, and I have a theory on what the slots were meant for and why there's four of them specifically, why not some other number. And I reckon they were meant to have a DV25 connection in them each, two serial and two parallel for four ports, use the four slots. Some cases and boards were designed for these ports to fit in side on, soldered on to the motherboard, sort of like ATX motherboards, and it had sort of makes sense. My 2866 was like that, the, the case had the holes for it, and I've seen motherboards that would fit there. It 
that thing's not in that chassis anymore, it's in this one. I really do need to do that updated machines video, because a lot of them have changed since their initial video. Anyway, in this machine, we have one of the serial ports in the form of a DB9, as that became more common later on. Uh, originally, DB25 was pretty much your only option. It was certainly the wider norm, if nothing else. Well, that card at the top there could be an ad-lib clone, or it could be a CD controller, and given what we've seen, it's pretty obvious it's the latter. And the socket is set annoyingly far back, so most cables won't fit in, except really slim Dr. Dre ones or whatever, which is pretty annoying, but not really surprising. It's it's sort of, I don't know, uh, yeah, it, it reminds me of the jacks that come with Sony headphones now, where they're real narrow, so you can only fit Sony headphones in them. Sony really is the apple of Japan, they're just a fucking shit company. They've made some good stuff in the past, but they've just got more and more shit as time's gone on. Garbage. That slot looks suspect, as it doesn't resemble the other slot blanks, so that'd be a hard drive controller of some kind, I guess. Our actual sound card is just beneath it. You probably know what it is already, there aren't too many that are this ugly. Two video cards. Unfortunately, one is being rather broken right now, so I can't show you very much of what it does today, so don't get your hopes up. Ethernet. The machine would likely have had that even back in its time, as there's really every chance this thing would have been acting as a server somewhere in some office building. Ah, well, that's just boring. Let's strip this thing off and see what it's got to show us in there. Unfortunately, the case is quite badly made, and a lot of screw holes don't line up well. Not to mention they've been stripped long before I got my hands on this thing and put this motherboard in here that I got the chassis empty. I think these had a 486SX25 in, to be honest, which is actually a bit disappointing. We just have to live with it. We're going to have to. Ah, oh, now that's pretty though, isn't it? Where are your eyes drawn fast? It's hard to choose with this one, but we'll start with that motherboard. It's massive, and it's actually a little longer than most full AT boards, to the point that it is touching the front of the chassis. I'm honestly convinced that this was never fully standardised, this layout. They all seem to be a little bit different. You'll have to forgive me for not removing the board again, as it's really, really difficult to get in and out of there. There's not a removable try on this case, and moving it around seems to break it. It keeps breaking down, and I have to keep hitting it with the handle of my screwdriver and perking things to, to make it work again. I, it's probably not going to live very long. As we're in the general area, the RAM takes up a huge proportion of the motherboard. There are 72 DRAM ICs total in DIP4. Someone will probably be screaming that they're too slow, as 20 MHz is 50 nanoseconds, and their RAM is 100 nanoseconds, but 386 machines almost invariably have at least one weight state, and even without that, the CPU can take between three and five cycles to actually access the memory, so it's not something I'm going to worry about. As such, 100 nanoseconds is pretty standard, then more than good enough for a 20 megahertz system. It would have been expensive enough anyway without having to pay for impossibly fast DRAM. I'm not actually sure that they were making 50 nanosecond DRAM chips at the time, and if they were, the yields would have been shit, and it would have been very expensive. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, cost no object to buying a machine like this, but, hmm, I don't know if you want to make it that expensive, that's probably going to just make it an obtainium. We have a megabytes of RAM in here, which is more than normal, as 2 megs seems to be par for the course on machines from this time. I don't really need 8 megabytes, there's pretty much nothing this machine's going to run comfortably that would have a problem running in the stock 2 megabytes. I mean, a lot of software is still stuck in conventional memory. But I could have 8 megabytes, and so I decided that was a good enough reason, and I ought to have 8 megabytes. I'm sure you understand. If this board had been made just a tiny bit later, it might have gotten those fancy new SIM slots. Interestingly, the ICs are actually the same chips as used on those, but in dip form, and you can sort of see what's going on. Picture each column of nine chips as the equivalent of one SIM. Unfortunately, these 80s DRAMs seem to be failing rapidly as time goes on, so here's hoping my ones have some yards left in them. You can see here on another 1987 board from Everex that SIM slots had appeared with support for up to 1 megabyte sticks. That, that's the limit. You can't put the 4 meg ones in here, they, they won't work. The board will ignore the extra RAM, report the wrong size, and just piss and moan at you. 
Their board also has a 387 socket exclusively, whereas our one has both that and the 287 socket. Incidentally, on a slightly older board from CAF, made in the same year, CAF Technologies, not CAF as in a parson, you have only the 287 socket, and this was pretty normal for earlier 386 boards, as the 387 wasn't available until quite late in 1986. You always think, really, early 386s might have been more of the market for the 287XL than 286s, really. Possibly. Uh, we're using a ULSI 387DX in here, which came from the Everex board, and it's not the fastest FPU around by a long shot, but it'll do just fine in here. It's not like I don't own faster ones, and yeah, I'm using things with those, so we'll use this because I didn't have a ULSI one in anything. I don't really care, you know, it makes no odds. I, I, I wouldn't be using a PC from 1987 if I really gave a fuck about speed either. <laughs> it doesn't matter. These big boards tend to have a lot of hours on them, and unfortunately they're quite prone to dying due to PALs and LSIs failing. This 7 pc and t chipset is probably the first real LSI based 38 chipset around, and it shows because its performance is extremely mediocre, there's no advantage over the, the glue logic implementations in this, and the immature CMES process leads to ICs that die without warning, no matter how much you arrange them in a circle around the CPU in some demonic ritual to make the thing work. I don't know, that's just what it makes me think of. You might as well put candles around them and just put a pentagram there, inverted, of course. These chipsets have about had it, I think all the demons have got out of them, and it requires bashing and perking and heating up occasionally to be brought back for just a little while. I don't know what fails in them, maybe the internal bond wires give out or something, who knows. It could be a chemical process, given these are CMOS, and that was, as I said, not really all that mature for this scale of implementation yet. It, it wasn't perfect, and the margins for error were extremely low. One of the reasons NMOS was used for so long is that the, the margins were quite broad. It, it could withstand, you know, a few spikes of voltage and current and stuff without really shitting the bed, or a CMOS just the early on the slate, it's a little blip, and it'd just kill the whole fucking thing. Still, there's no way around it, the computer is going to die to these LSIs, there will be the death of it, it's going to have liver failure, it's going to just fucking scream in agony and stop fucking working, and I suppose we could keep it running for as long as I can obtain more of these LSIs, as really there's no specialised chips on the motherboard anywhere, there's a couple of PALs which I've backed up, and so, yeah, we can make more of those, we can always put new PROMs out, and the rest of it's pretty much just 7-4 logic and resistor packs, so you can replace that shit forever. The Everex we saw tried to dodge using LSIs by opting for an entirely glue logic and PAL implementation, like all the boards did. Plus, I don't think a 25 MHz capable chipset actually existed yet, so it's possible they just didn't have a choice. This too has proven a failure at this point, largely in the form of the PALs which run very hot and they seem to just get hotter with time and they have broken. If someone has a working one of these boards and can dump the PALs using like an EEPROM like programmer, you, you can read PALs in a lot of them, I could probably make this board work again. Which would be nice, as it's the one I was going to use, it's the first one I got for this project, and it has an awesome 64k cache on board. Again, relying on glue and pals instead of forking out for the Intel 385 controller. Whereas none of the older boards, like the, the CAF one or the one we're using, have that feature at all. Most 386s didn't come with cache back then, and even those that had the feature usually didn't populate the cache sockets. You might remember us discussing how expensive DRAM was, and, well, uh, yeah, this is SRAM, and uh, you're probably going to suffer heart failure if we start showing you how much it would cost to, to do that sort of thing, so, yeah, it, it, I figured probably not surprising that most motherboards just didn't bother. It's not like the 486 era where leaving those sockets empty would turn people off. You just didn't really think about it too much, I would think, so <laughs> that's too fucking expensive. It probably helps that these are cheap Taiwan clones as well, but, well, kind of weird, because it is outliving the the American company up there. I'm pretty certain Everex were American, so, yeah, that's actually uh, 
quite surprising in a way. Now, back on the subject of LSIs, the A2206 is a fascinating thing that appears all over the place, and it is on all three of these giant 386 motherboards we've seen. 286 motherboards with the CNT A220 chipset like Lisa are where they first appeared in the 80s, but over time the chip shrank and continues to be used in the 386 and 486. I think even a handful of Pentium machines had it probably very early on. Oh, and the next gen 586 used it to actually get an IS Airbus as well. And it was in a smaller PQFP package by then. It's often referred to as the IPC, Integrated Peripheral Controller in Literature, and contains things like two DMA controllers, the two interrupt controllers, the AT254 counter, the system timer and such, the RTC by extension, and a bunch of other little things like that. Curiously, the Everex board lets you still use an external RTC if you want to. Our board just uses the 82206's internal one. And in case you're wondering, my 6 MHz 286 is too old to have an 82206 in it. That, that still just uses discrete ICs to do this stuff. So, yeah, um, it just gives you an idea of how things were progressing, I guess. I mean, it is actually quite interesting seeing all this chipset stuff and the size of the board. By the time these were made, they, they were starting to shrink. The integration is, we're right on the cusp. You can see the early rumblings of that rapid acceleration that we're going to get going into the 90s. And 386 boards are going to be a lot smaller, a lot cheaper. It's going to become a very popular platform. You, you're starting to see that this thing is the Amiga killer. It just needs to needs to get a bit smaller and, and get get that price down. And it's coming. It's, it is coming very rapidly at this point. You can see it happening right before your eyes. You know, this motherboard's pretty weird. Uh, I'm not actually sure if it was ever meant to be in uh, a regular PC case or it's just that these things weren't particularly standardised or what. I mean... Uh, it has a hard drive LED pass-through, which is right above the slot you'd logically put the controller in anyway. Uh, and that goes up to the front panel connector, which is now the back above the power supply connector. It's, it's a little bit odd. Uh, when the board came from Jordan, it had these little plastic push rivet things that it had been mounted with. I've never seen those anywhere else. So the, the mounting holes on these big boards never quite seem to be in the same place. I don't know what the hell it was designed for. It's, uh, it's pretty weird. Uh, the other thing I do have to wonder is the, the guy I bought it from, what he must have thought when he saw the name of the guy who'd bought it, if he even paid attention. Uh, <laughs> although that sort of messed with his head a little bit. But, well, yeah, that's how these things are. It's, uh, I do think that calf board is probably an earlier design of this. Like, that's probably like uh, C&T's reference design. Different companies just changed up their board layout as they saw fit. Uh, it, it's, this whole thing is uh, not well documented, if at all. I, I actually do have some level of documentation for those two boards. This one, nothing. I just have to figure it all out myself to get it to go and... Uh, Obviously we have, but that's uh, another thing you've got to think about if you want to start getting into this weird shit. I've said before, you know, it's, uh, if you don't like having to do that, you best find one of the big OEM brands and just buy their shit, because you, you're probably going to have 30, 40 years of documentation on it. You get into stuff like this where it's the only one you know of been around. I mean, there must be another one that exists somewhere out there. You'd, you'd think, you'd fucking hope. Yeah, you just sort of in the dark, and you've just got to sort of perk your fingers in and see what it does. And well, maybe that'll work, maybe it won't. But you can't just ask someone or go and find a buck. You're just stuck. You're gonna to have to figure it out, or it's not gonna get done. It's your only only option. Uh, luckily, I, I quite like putting things on the hard setting, so it don't really bother me. But it's always worth remembering that you see, oh, that looks cool. Just be aware of the the fucking hardship you're getting yourself into if you want to play around with it. Now, hanging off the IS Airbus is integrated serial and parallel on this motherboard, which is positioned up by those high slots in the case, and unfortunately I can't get you a very good shot of it. You do have dip switches to enable and disable the, the two serials and two parallels, and yeah, I, I probably only have one serial port on just for the simplicity of it. I've used the other, they do work, I just don't need all of them on right now. 
and I, I was having resource issues somewhere. Now, as for the slots we get, there are a couple of 8-bit ones, which almost seems pointless when they didn't have to get out of the way of the logic chips. The board is branded, and hmm, I quite like that name for some reason. Yeah, if you don't know me, that's the name I use. Well, not quite. It's not spelt quite the same way. It's not what it says on my bath certificate, but it's the name I use. That's quite a long story, and one I don't really see any need to tell you. It's not very interesting. The bottom slot is a memory upgrade slot, which lets you install more RAM. I doubt this was widely used at all. It also appears on the CAF branded board, and it looks identical there, and the Everex even has its own version of it. Now, this isn't a standard ISA slot. Don't go plugging 16-bit cards in. I haven't tested to see if you can use 8-bit cards in it, and they don't seem to fit, so I'm not quite sure. It'd be easy to find out because ISA is parallel, so it should just be pin 1 is pin 1 on all the slots, and pin 2 is pin 2. They should all have continuity between each slot. Uh, except on 8088 machines, where that would be slot 8, which is its own thing, and I, I'm not going to go into it. There's lots and lots of documentation for that. I don't believe 386s were still doing that. It's quite telling, though. I mean, yeah, you know, I'll bash on it stupid proprietary memory cards, and uh, fuck off, but, I mean, how are you going to fit more RAM on the motherboard while we're still using dips? You're not going to be able to do it, so this is really your only option is to do something like this. I mean, there's a few other ways you could do it, but you are just going to have to hang some kind of daughter card off the motherboard. And, to be honest, the ISA bus itself, at this point, is starting to look rather anemic. It is starting to, to get a bit too long in the tooth, and, yeah, it, it holds these machines back a little bit. It doesn't matter so much at the time, but you can really sort of feel it when you're pushing the machine there. It's a little bit contented now. You know, we're starting, we've got a CPU that can keep the bus busy, like, more often than not, and peripherals that will try to master the bus, and they will stuff quite a bit of data up and down it, and it's maybe not as quick as it needs to be to be taking full advantage of a, a really fast 32-bit machine. Obviously, we would fix this going into the 90s, well... We would fix this with EISA, but who really gives a fuck about that shit? That that just never shows up, and it's horrible anyway. I will never work with EISA, I refuse. You will never see that on this channel unless I happen to find a machine or are using it in the bin. It's just... I, I'm not touching it. And thankfully this thing's just playing ISA, so... It's good. Oh man, it, it makes me so grateful for VLB and PCI, it really does. I'm sure somewhere there's an alternate universe where we just got EISA version 2 or something. A fucking micro channel. Oh, oh no! I'm just going to move on. So yeah, yeah. expansion cards, expansion cards. Uh, well, moving on from the undersized, underwhelming bus, there's this shriveled up little disappointment: the Sony CR R334. It's for the creative branded Sony CDU 33A. We could put an unbranded bezel on it, but I don't really care. This drive isn't working very well, and I'm not surprised as most of them were dropping like flies by the mid-90s at only a year or two of age. So, yeah. Curiously, this model, or probably a slightly older one, was likely the first CD-ROM drive I ever used, although I think it was on the less usual 40-pin version of the SLCD interface that has a 4-pin ID jumper. It looks suspiciously like MKE, but it isn't. The one we have in here is on the older, weird 34-pin SLCD interface, which seems to be the more common of the two. The cables for it are basically floppy cables without twisting them, so it's pretty easy to adapt one of those if you ever need such a cable. I'm not convinced you ever will, because as I say, these drives usually don't work, they cost a lot of money, and they're pretty crap. The audio header is wired directly to the headphone socket, there's no circuitry between there. And these drives use a Molex KK connector, but the later DuPont cables will work fine on them. And that's what everyone ended up using, well, until we got those weird ones with the clip and the teeth on the bottom. But otherwise, it was just plain DuPont. I imagine they were cheaper, and that's why people did it that way. The interface card has marks for an external drive connector. Both internally and externally, only about 18 pins are used. And it's about the same as the CD mechanism in the PS1. You almost wonder if the SLCD interface maybe lived a bit longer in there. I, I wouldn't know. 
The controller being 8-bit does make me question if these might work on an 8088 machine, but it probably wouldn't be much use in that, and the dreadful drives at the best of times. It's not very useful in this thing either. Even if it was fully working, it's kind of limited. I wanted to play Willy Beamish on it, but it's not fucking having it. And it's also the first drive I've ever encountered that can't read 74-minute CDRs. As our chassis has no 3.5 bays, the floppy drive lives in this adapter bay thingy. It's just a regular 1.4 meg drive from the 2000s, and I didn't put it in there, so I guess the original one failed on whatever machine was in this. It's not at all special. Below that, though, is something real special, which falls in line with our next expansion card. Then again, the floppy drive did, so I guess I skipped over that until now. It's almost like there's some thought goes into the order of operations here. You know, you've got to have four play, it's fucking, it just makes it feel better afterwards, it's a little bit more rewarding. You can't fail to notice this massive long thing just sticking out there. It's a distributed processing technology, PM3011E-75, or is that a 65 or a 70? I don't know. It's an ESDI controller which supports up to four hard drives. And it can do mirroring and mapping to logical drives and all manner of fancy things that just sort of scream RAID controller, but it's not called a RAID controller. Most of these features don't work in DOS. The mirroring will, but that's about it. It doesn't really matter because a machine like this probably ran something like Unix or Xenix when acting as a server anyway but there's not much parts in me running those today, so they're just awkward and I'd rather not get into them. And I'm also not handing over the money for that many hard drives, and I'd have to fabricate stuff to fit more of them in the chassis under the power supply or something. It's just a headache I don't want to get into, and it would push the cost of this thing probably towards four figures, which I'm just not willing to do. I mean, it's really cheap compared to what it would have cost in the 80s, but that's not the point. Hanging off this card are these two Hitachi DK515s, they're about two thirds of a gig each, somewhere around 700-800 meg, I can't actually remember totally. These are full height drives, and apparently they run at 7200 RPM. I'm not sure I believe that, but I believe 5400, and well, I don't know, they, they sound pretty fast. They, they get hotter than hell. And they had bezels, but these were damaged in shipping. So I'll be learning how to mold plastics and make some new ones and other things eventually. This DPT controller is one of the few that these drives will work with, as they don't function with Adeptech cards nor really much of anything else. I think I went through about four controllers, and yeah. We have to use weird translation modes on this one as it is and lose a chunk of capacity, though. I mean, it's 600-some megabytes in an 80s machine. I'm not really going to be that upset about it. Controller and drive compatibility, and really just ESDI in general, is unfortunately rather poorly documented. It uses the same cables as the early MFM interface, including that 34-pin one that's like a floppy cable with a twist in the other place. This whole machine's on 34 fucking pin. But the signal in for ESDI versus the older RLL and MFM interfaces is different, so the two, they're not interchangeable. Still, we know a few interesting things about this interface. One thing, a lot of the communication is serial, much like present-day SATA, and rather unlike its contemporary SCSI and soon-to-be ATA. We know the interface could go quite fast, up to 3 megabytes a second, nearly four times faster than MFM and over three times faster than RLL. And while SCSI could do up to 5 megabytes per second, the drives were usually the limit, and furthermore, the same fucking drives. To the point a lot of them were literally just the same drives, and they came with a little bridge board <laughs> screwed on the back. Ours even have the screw holes for those little bridge boards, and I've seen them out there with them on. ESDI seems to have come about somewhere around 1983 initially, which makes me think there must be 8-bit controllers for it, but I've never seen one, and it was designed by Maxter. And despite that, it actually works. Hard to think now, Maxter used to be a good brand, after all those really shit hard drives they made in the 2000s, and Dell fucking lapped those things up. Its speed and feature set grew over time, and curiously, it has tentative support for optical drives and external interfaces with removable drives, 
on some systems. I've never seen an ESDI optical drive. I'd like to see one. I'd like to get one. I think that'd be fucking awesome. But I have heard of external ESDI buses with cases full of drives in trays or on rails. You didn't have those caddies like we got with IDE drives. The, the drive itself just acted like the caddy. I mean, they're fucking huge. Most drives you see out in the wild are on rails. Mine were. ESDI, like SCSI, can support up to seven drives. Being 3-bit, there is the facility for an 8th ID, so I assume the controller uses this, and does as far as I can tell, much like SCSI. Similarly, the bus also requires correctly configured termination. It also has the ability to do things like staggered spin-up and spindle synchronization, so these aren't really things you tend to see on 1980s hard disk interfaces. It really is quite sophisticated and does feel a lot like SCSI, just with serial connections instead of parallel ones. As it is, SCSI would eventually outpace and outnumber ESDI, but until then... ESDI was the interface of choice for high-performance machines, even a little way into the 1990s, so the interface probably lived for about a decade, which really isn't bad. Our controller even has 512k of cache on it, with the ability to upgrade farther. I have a 4MB daughter card that came with it, but it's not working due to faulty DRAM chips and it's fucking surface mount shit, so I won't be able to fix it. Unfortunately, this controller seems to deliberately cripple itself without it. It's an, uh, This controller's fucking horrible. No matter what you might think, DPT's implementation is just bad. It's nasty to work with. The utilities are fucking shit. It pisses and moans about every little thing. It's one of those, it's our way or not at all jobs. And to be quite honest, I wouldn't have been upset if I'd accidentally stood on a thing and broke it. Still, the SCSI parallels as far as feature set go don't end where well, we've already covered as the controller has the option of onboard SCSI for external drives. That was maybe for CD support or tape support. I, ESDI can do tape drives, but yeah, I could see that being for an external tape drive, the, the SCSI interface. It's not populated on my card and I don't need it, but I guess that was an option. That's probably what the 7.5 model of the card did, and mine's probably the 7.0. I, I don't fucking know. Oh, cars, it's, it's doing its job, just don't touch it, because it'll break. Another curiosity here is that Adaptec got into the market by making ESDI controllers and later moved to SCSI. Adaptec would later purchase DPT. I suspect certain parts of the DPT DNA remain, as the LED patterns on this controller will probably look uncanny to anyone who's familiar with an Adaptec RAID card. You really do have to wonder sometimes. I'm almost surprised there's enough electricity left to run those lights, as those hard drives suck enough to light a couple of decently sized rooms. This incandescent light bulb uses less power than those hard drives. <laughs> we have a 230 watt power supply in the machine, but we're still sort of treading a bit of a fine line pushing our luck here, so... <laughs> Let's hope it holds up, I've already had to repair it once. Yeah, I actually repaired a switch mode supply, but it was just a dead fan. If the supply itself breaks, I can't fix it. They're, they're unfixable switch mode supplies, they just don't fix. Next up, the Sound Blaster 1.5. It's so well known that I'm not going to talk about it very much here, as the rest of the machine is far more interesting, but it's doing what Sound Blasters do. Making loads of fucking noise! Oh, I knew I should have forked out for the fucking Thunderboard. I wasn't planning to use this Western Digital VGA card, and like the Sound Blaster, it's not really very interesting. These don't seem to be too quick, but they work well, and they will be fine for an 80s machine that got upgraded to VGA. Like, when a fast visa mode's going to really bother this thing? What the hell is it going to run that needs them? The rest of the machine will be the limit well before that sort of thing becomes a problem. I mean, it's easy to look at this card and be like, oh, you can't even move a meg per second into the fucking crane buffer. <laughs> but, I mean, it, 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 it's an older VGA implementation, and in this particular use case, it's not slow in the same way that the 386 isn't slow. It's just not as fast as things that came out later that were designed to go faster. Hopefully you followed that, and if not, well, tough shit, because I'm not explaining it. We were supposed to be using the card below for video, uh, the Spear FGA 860HE4. It has VGA on board in the form of a headland chip, which is actually really slow, and it ran into problems. 
so I disabled that VGA chip and hence the Western Digital. It also has the Texas Instruments 34020 at 32 MHz. In the 80s, the TMS340 was a powerhouse, already trying to be a GPU of sorts. It was the first real graphics-oriented processor of its kind. It really is like a general-purpose processor. You would run the programs on it, but it was graphics-oriented. It really does sound conceptually a lot like a modern GPU. It's extremely capable. It can display resolutions of up to 2560 by 2560 in 32-bit color. Hmm, correction. Actually, the theoretical max is somewhere about 16384 by 16384, which is pretty silly. I doubt if anything ever actually did that, or if there was Ramdex capable of it, but yeah, as far as I know, that is the max theoretical resolution of the chip itself. It can handle a ridiculous number of on-screen objects and do some amount of 3D rendering on its own. Our card here has 4 megs of VRAM, but it can be upgraded up to 32 megs. The TMS340 also supports an FPU, but our speaker card preferred to offer support for an Intel i860 on a daughter card instead. Of course, you can still use the processors in the computer, the, the 386, the 387, or a, a WayTech, or WeTech, as I've heard some people call them. The TMS340, while not usually seen, wasn't exactly a failure, as it displayed real-time 3D on a PC long before this was widely possible. It saw use in workstations, and it was really successful in arcades. TI also pushed Sega and Nintendo to manufacture a console based on this chip, and obviously this never happened, but I would love to have seen what they'd come up with if they did. It probably would have been the 34010, which isn't quite as ballsy as our 020, but still a very capable piece of hardware. Unfortunately, I really won't be able to show you much of this Tiger card, Texas Instruments Graphics Accelerator, it's TI's name for their standard when it's in a PC, but our one seems to have broken down. We do at least have years of documentation on arcade machines using the same IC if you want to see more of these in action, and I do have some old footage of it running things, but you'll have to excuse that when we get to it, as it's not really particularly great because of the issues that were going on back then and I was testing so you know I did. anyways you, you know I can't help but find it funny though how this car that was in the early 90s admittedly this one already solving a problem that a certain mid 90s accelerator failed to solve in that you didn't need a separate VGA card to use the damn thing pretty funny that really shows that there was no excuse doesn't it the output of the Headland VGA can be sent to the Tiger side of the card, where it will be upscaled and fed to that monitor. The 9-pin interface there is essentially just VGA, with the intention of it being connected to a high-resolution monitor. You can also run it in a dual monitor configuration, and you will have like text output from the console, the command prompt, on the VGA screen, while you have the Tiger's output on, obviously, whichever you've got plugged into the 9-pin interface there. So it's, it's very good for debugging when you're trying to write programs for it and stuff, I, I would imagine. And also very useful in applications like CAD. The only mode available for the TI on this card is 1280 by 1024 Despite that gigantic, serious potatoes, ceramic gets quite hot. REM deck there, it only goes up to 8-bit color on this one, but... The chip is capable of a hell of a lot more. Oh, and uh, there's my Ethernet card. It's really boring and intermittent, so yeah, that's a thing. Uh, this video is getting really fucking long and I'm getting exhausted, so let's start this machine up. Well, the memory count's rather long. Weird how it goes faster between 640k and 1 meg, then slows down again. I'll just skip the rest of it. The hard disk controller wakes up, the system beeps angrily a few times, and we're off.
the bias is that horrid one, like the tendon. The, it's not broken here. It also has this rather nice diagnostic tool. It reminds me of the uh, MFM, the, the monitor that's built into uh, Zenith machines. It can test quite a few things like video I.O. floppy and apparently hard disks, but we can't do that for obvious reasons. It, it's really quite nice. Of course, we're running DOS. As a state, a machine like this probably wouldn't have run DOS back then. It's not a very fast machine compared to the, the 90s stuff we're usually spoiled by, but yeah, no, who cares? It defies the object. You don't need it to go fast. You managed 3,920 dry stones in an SSI, 1,176 wet stones. All these tests are done at 16 megahertz, as that's what the processor's rated for, and it seems to be the stock speed the system will start up at. Um, yeah, it wasn't unusual to have a CPU one step below the max speed of the system back then, and I'm going to take it as being one of those where the manual would have told you not to run it at, like, turbo speed all the time. Uh, that would technically be overclocking. That that did happen. This This wasn't so unusual. There's someone out there that's bound to ask, and it's a perfectly sensible question. Could you put a Cyrix 486 DLC in this thing and make it perform better? And no. The motherboard doesn't like those. The machine won't run on them, or it'll run and just crash almost immediately. The disk controller won't start up. Just things like that. And even if you could get past that point, which you might be able to do, you're not going to get the full performance because you don't have, like, hidden refresh on the board or anything. I mean, it'd still theoretically go a little bit faster than a, a plain 386, but probably not really enough to be worth it. And I wouldn't really bother anyway, it's not something I'd be interested in doing on this. Uh, supposedly the later 386s were a little bit faster than these older ones, like the later Intel ones with the white logo and the DX moniker. Ours is old enough that it doesn't have that DX label on it, it's just a 386-16. It does have the double sigma to say it works properly in 32-bit mode though, so that's probably good, even though we're not really doing a whole lot of 32-bit on there just yet. It's, uh, maybe I have to test that sometime. I'm sure I tested it once years ago, but yeah, I wouldn't mind testing that, uh, but I don't think there'll be a difference. And it's a notable thing that on a machine this age, that's your only option. You have Intel 386. There's no AMD. They weren't making them yet, so... You, maybe there were some of those IBM ones in the metal tin, if you knew someone who could steal one, might have been a very small quantity of them got outside the company somehow, but those were just the Intel design, so yeah, that, that's it, Intel 386 or Intel 386, that's, that's all you can put in this thing, that's all it's ever going to do, so yeah, oh well, uh, it doesn't really bother me, I mean that's kind of why I bought an Intel 386, because that's what I wanted to run, but like I say, I figured I should answer that question before anyone asks it. It's not a bad question. And yeah, certainly uh, the, the different revisions of Intel 386, I, I imagine the AMD ones were probably the later design as well. So maybe we, we might test that out someday in passing somewhere else, but this video is going to be really long, so I'm not doing it today. Plus, it's really hard to get in there. I think I'd do it on a different motherboard, <laughs> not this one. This thing's just too awkward, too precarious, and it likes breaking down too much. It already broke again from filming all this. I think 3D Bench is broken. It scores 38.6 there. Hmm, 38.6. Knows we got a 386. Maybe it's not broken. I don't know. Be mindful I have 486s that score lower and run this test a hell of a lot faster. PC player is 1.1. It's far enough. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Top Bench, 37 top marks. It seems about right. Speed sys shows us 3.67 CPU score. So, okay, 36 megs a second memory bandwidth is perfectly fine. It's not at all bad, but it certainly shows how slow things were until we got fancy memory interleave and whatnot on later chipsets, such as the Peak. But yeah, if we interleave the four sort of groups of nine memory chips in a single bank, it would go about as fast. That's how that worked. The ICs didn't really get significantly faster or anything uh, going into the 90s. Well, they, they did, but it kind of didn't count. It was the, the interleaving and stuff that made the major difference. And there's no cache on here, so obviously we're going to have no results for that. 
It's a mere 9.6 megs a second for memory throughput. Again, it's everything's really just glue logic equivalent shoved in LSIs. It's not doing anything clever, this machine, as far as that goes. It seems perfectly fine for me for a system of this age. If we fiddle with things, we can just sort of get it to double figures at the cost of stability, but I'm not really bothered. The hard disk is interesting as the numbers vary wildly every time I run the test. Seek time is going to be thrown out completely as the drives just they don't respond to seek commands. The caching controller is obviously what's receiving that and it's not requesting anything back from the drive so it's not going to seek the drive heads. Uh, speed sys kind of does and kind of doesn't. It, you're just going to get broken results. We can ignore those. Buffered reads of nearly 1 meg are pretty good for an 80s machine. Verify and read average out anywhere from 200 to 300k per second, but the drive seems to not really be doing a whole lot in this time, so I sort of think these results might also be wrong, and it's probably just more controller shenanigans, as it performs way better than that outside of speed sys. It actually feels really quick when you're under DOS and everything. And I have reason to suspect it might actually be a bit faster than SCSI. SDI seems to hammer the interrupts a, a lot less than SCSI does to me. I Maybe I'm just imagining it or something. I, I'm not, I haven't worked with SCSI controls this all. I've only worked with 90s ones, so maybe this is something that came in later. I don't really know. But but yeah, most of the time outside the benchmarks, it feels anywhere from half a meg to a meg to me on this thing. It's pretty good, but again, I cannot confirm this. I suppose we could try moving a huge file and uh, timing it. Maybe we'll do that sometime. But even if the speed sys results are correct, uh, given that a lot of early 90s IDE drives can't go this fast, yeah, this thing's absolutely gunning it for an 80s machine as far as hard disk access goes. As I want to emphasize, you really can't trust a hard disk benchmark with a caching controller like this. I mean, obviously it's going to do that test and those LEDs are going to flicker like it's going out of fashion. You might be able to make out the flicker, you might not, depending on the camera's shutter speed at the moment. It's sat on auto right now. Um, the LED is going to come on on the chassis. But if you put them bezels on the drives, it'll only light up very intermittently, like every few seconds or so. And you can actually hear that if you listen to the drives. Here, yeah, it just does a little crack of the head and then stops. But obviously it's still running, the test's still happening. And SysInfo does the same thing. SysInfo is actually clever enough to detect that it's behind the caching controller. It comes up and tells you. So... I don't really think we can trust the numbers for anything as far as uh, disk tests go. DPT might have a utility for it, but I wouldn't trust that either because they made the controller, so they'd probably just lie. Uh, they, they're a bit scummy, the, this company. It seems the ones who make this fancy hardware often are, especially disk controllers and such. So I wouldn't trust anything that they said uh, at all. Ah, oh, fucking camera's gone. That, that's because I put my hand in front of the light, isn't it? Or because I pointed it at the CRT. Ah, joke's on you. Guess what? This is actually the last thing I filmed for this video. <laughs> so it can fucking be broken. So, uh, it's blast lasers in it. That usually gets it going. I don't recommend doing this. You can destroy your uh, camera if you start doing this sort of shit with it, but usually if we flick that in there enough, it'll come good. Oh, I'm about out of memory card anyway. Right, well, uh, pointless as it is, I can make it run. Well, execute Doom. That'll finish in about 49,486 real ticks. You're not going to be playing it on this thing, but that, that was always to be expected. I don't really care. It, it just gives us a, a number to, to look at for scale. We discussed before that you would get more speed for general use out of a 286 as the platform was a far bit more mature and it was already seeing fancy features like that memory interleave appearing, my 16 megahertz one we mentioned earlier can do that. The 386 would ultimately benefit from cache as well, which we don't have in here and it would make a, a notable difference as machines started to, to come with that feature. And 
as we noted, that feature normally wasn't present back then. It was usually absent, either not on the board at all, or just not populated if it was, because SRAM cost a hell of a lot of money. You probably want... I mean, if it didn't, you'd probably use SRAM instead of DRAM, because it was a hell of a lot faster, right? And, yeah, nobody does that. It's all fucking slow-ass DRAM. You know, you, you've got to balance the cost somewhere. You probably want to see a couple of games running on here, so, yeah. It, it'll do that if you want it to, about as well as you'd expect. It's nothing special, good or bad. Duke 2 doesn't run amazingly, and it's a little bit crash-prone, so you, you probably won't be doing that on here. I have a feeling it's the AD2 206 steadily failing, as it's having some major DMA troubles, and that does seem to be a failure mode on these, where the IRQ or DMA controller parts of them just go out. They, they go intermittent, and then the whole chip just dies and gets really hot. Everything else seems to work, though, and I even managed to get sound work in a monster bash after copious amounts of fiddling. I like podgy titles, but I'd, they dropped the ball on this one. Can't fucking stand this game. Right, well, anyway, uh, the machine comes in a tad too slow for another game I don't much like, Wolfenstein 3D. Um, game doesn't run very well either, has these graphical corruption issues. You see, this is my problem with this one, is it just doesn't work properly for me a lot of the time. I don't really care on this machine, it's not quick enough to play it, but yeah. Ultima Underworld. We could boost performance a little if we go into 20 megahertz mode, uh, pushing the momentary tarbo button. I've not swapped it yet, it's still a latching button. Imagine it's momentary. Uh, funny thing is, if you press it again, the system won't return 16 megahertz, but it will divide the clocks by two once more, and you'll get 8 megahertz. Press it again, 10 megahertz. Press it again, back to 16. There's another mode I've been unable to trigger reliably whereby the clocks get divided again by 4 and this yields us 2 MHz, 2.5, 4 MHz and 5 MHz clocks. Presumably this is for 8088 compatibility. It's pretty crazy and I, I can't quite figure out how to get in there. It just, I just seem to turn this mode on and off by accident occasionally. It may be a keyboard shortcut to do it. Um, I don't know. We have this 4-bit starting speed selector thing on the motherboard as well, which, uh, you know, it, it seems to sort of be more of a suggestion because the logic seems to use the CMOS battery to remember the previous state and saps a lot of power, so I might cut the track off for that because it... it yeah, some transistors have gone bad and they're, they're short and just draining my batteries and that, that whole circuit needs looking at uh, uh, one thing I do find weird is this three digit display and, uh, it's pretty neat how it's three seven segments but the leftmost one you can only set to one or off so yeah uh, that sucks because it would have been ni nice to have like you know set the speed to like 386, 286, 186, 086 or something but uh, you can't do that or just well it would only display two of them I guess so but you get the idea. I didn't know these were available in green. This is the older type. When you look at the corners, it has the square bottom segment and then those rounded edges. And the ones you see are usually the 80s design that sort of just carried through to the present day where they have the beveled corners. Yeah, I didn't know this older 70s type was available in green. You can see them there. Uh, the, the, there's the red type that's, that's more common. I quite liked this... Uh, this style of them, it looked quite nice. I suppose I could rewire it. I think there's a, a second Tarbo LED output on the motherboard, and that some combination of that makes, you know, yeah. I'd need to look into it. Everything's there's no documentation. I have to reverse engineer everything myself, and it's not like I have logic analyzers or oscilloscopes. I can't afford shit like that. So. My analysis is usually put my fingers on it and see what it feels like, and that's, that's the best I've got. So then, that Sony drive. No motorized tray, which is kind of novel. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the advantage of, say, the old Mitsumi drives, where you could still eject it when the system was off. It does need electricity, so... Yeah, well, that's Sony for you. It can't read CDRs, so that kind of sucks. It also works quite intermittently at the best of times. I wanted to play you some tacky 90s CDs with it, 
but it doesn't seem to like doing that and it's not going to do it today and I can't just sit here forever until it does so yeah uh, forget that then well last on the list is that tiger card I really wish it was working I really do awesome piece of hardware I do have a few things I can probably show you uh, anything from logos to included demos and I don't know unfortunately those were recorded on the 6 MHz 286 and I was having problems getting the, the H sync dialed in the, the output you can't put the right parameters in if you do it refuses to work it's just a complete shit show trying to set it up for a monitor in Spears software it's completely broken all the card was already defective which is entirely possible but what you will see is that this thing was quick. I'm, I'm sort of glad it was on a 6 megahertz machine. And you, you will see the capabilities because there's no way the machine would do that. I was aspiring to relearn C and learn to program this card. But it looks like that won't be happening unless I can find another one someday. As this thing, like that cached auto board for my fucking disc controller, is all surface mount shite. Which means I can't fucking work on it. And it's probably one of the pals that's gone out or something anywhere it's a real shame, but hey, that's the thing that happens when you're playing with 30 plus year old hardware. It was never really built to last this long, and really, like the rest of the machine, it's probably just going to break down at some point. And, well, evidently this part already has. So what I'll do, and uh, before we cut back to that dickhead in front of the camera, is I'll just leave you with a little montage of the card running things, and footage from arcade machines and Texas Instruments little marketing video that they did for this thing back in the 80s. talk about alternate universes. There's probably an alternate universe somewhere where I'm a vacuum cleaner enthusiast instead of a computer enthusiast. I mean, I thought Henry was the coolest thing on the street until we got a computer in the house. Uh, there's probably an you know, alternate universe where we, we had EISA, like keep incrementing into different versions. We talked about that. There's probably one more universe somewhere where Texas Instruments just dominated the graphics market throughout the 90s. Uh, I'd like to see that one, but we don't live on any of these timelines, and we're in uh, the one that we're in, I guess. Unless it changes without warning. Uh, who knows? Anyways, yeah, this machine, uh, it's not super useful, really, is it? I mean, unless we want to run it as some, like, old-timey server or something. Uh, a lot of the, the extra capabilities on the disk controller are sort of redundant. And, yeah, you know, from a practical standpoint, we could just get a 90s 386SX and it would run better than this thing. But that's really not the point. And I think everyone who, who's into this stuff has, has got at least something that's like that. You know, it's not like my K5 or that 16 MHz 286 where they're just super practical machines. You know, they're not really super special sort of hardware, they're, they're pretty run-of-the-mill and they just do their job and do it really really well 
Uh, but this thing's cool, you know, it's, it's a nice machine, it's nice to look at, I like the noise it makes, uh, it's fun to use, uh, you know, there's no, no problem with it in that regard, I don't know how long it'll last, it's going to break at some point, definitely, like I say, somebody probably paid like 10 grand or something for this, like if not more, like back in the 80s, it wouldn't surprise me, it's at least 8 grand for a machine like that, you know, the... So I don't think things like VGA card or, or anything are out of place. You spent that much on a machine, you would keep upgrading it for a while. You weren't just going to keep it for two or three yards and chuck it in the bin. So, you know, you figure they would have upgraded a couple of things. It's, it's a real nice machine, and it, it's a, a nice thing from, like, a historical standpoint, because you don't see very many of them, these big ones, and I think a lot of that probably is just the high hours, that a lot of them broke down, and, you know, a lot of them are just gone so yeah it's uh, it's always nice to see one even if it's uh, probably not going to be with us too long it's pretty much my last build I've, I've got every build I wanted at this stage there was this and one more uh, which we'll cover eventually which itself isn't vastly special to anyone but me uh, but yeah we'll get to that we'll have a look at it I don't know when uh, mm. Yeah, I don't think I have too much to say at the end of this one, actually. Obviously, I'm still having capture issues. I'm actually, I've reached the stage where I'm not going to do it on this one, but I am experimenting with it, so maybe there'll be one or two clips if I've forgotten something and I get it to work, where I'm going to see if I can convert Aura Vision to uh, just RAW and use that, like... <laughs> We'll just do video capture with the Pentium 66, that thing will work every fucking time. Uh, and you're like, ah, oh, why don't you just roll the clips out of your StarTech? Well, yeah, that shitty reskin fucking application it comes with, the files are broken enough that even you... I'm pretty certain they're using FFmpeg as a basis to write them, but they're probably setting it up wrong, because if you use FFmpeg to turn them into raw AVI, they're still corrupted, you get all sorts of missing frames and sync issues and there's just nothing I can do about it. So it's like, I, I should just use something else and that might be the easiest solution just to stick a composite converter on there. Um, so I'll look into it. But yeah, that's, uh, that's I think all I've got actually. There are other things I could talk about but this video is going to be an hour long so I think instead I'll just fuck off and leave it alone, and if there's anything else there, we'll just stick it on the end after the logo. So, uh, well, in that case, you know the drill. I'm High Treason, thanks for watching, and remember, don't be a screw-up, load DOS 622.